sunshine in our hearts right now, Heavenly Father. Thank you for everything that you're going to provide for us throughout the week, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, 
we know that you have all powers in your hand, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless the sick and the shedding, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, bless those, Heavenly Father, that have bereavement in their family, Heavenly Father. And comfort them, Heavenly Father, for knowing that you are the way and the truth and the light, Heavenly Father. Thank you for everything, Heavenly Father. Yes, yes. Because without you, Heavenly Father, it would be no us, Heavenly Father. Just bless everyone that's come out right now, Heavenly Father. Keep blessing those, Heavenly Father. Now, Heavenly Father, I ask those that you look upon those that are hurting right now, Heavenly Father, and that are seeking you, Heavenly Father. Seeking you and wanting to re-cleanse themselves, Heavenly Father. Re-cleanse themselves with the Word, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we cleanse themselves with the Spirit, Heavenly Father. Renew themselves with the uh, Spirit, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come to you and yes, just yes, yes. thank you. If I had a thousand tongues right now, Heavenly Father, I would not thank you enough yes, because yes. you are that, that mighty, Heavenly Father. I come to you, Heavenly Father, asking all these things in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. want to thank Deacon Thompson for the report of prayer and we now turn service over to our music department for the UBC singers.
2021 because a lot of times they don't know where they're coming or going and we think that we have a loving savior that is patient that is kind-hearted that is gracious and keeping us as we come to our feet for our scripture text which can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. And after 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, Matthew's 22nd chapter, 36 to the 40th verse. And it reads as follows. There will be a slight variation from what you're seeing on the screen to what I'm reading, because I am reading from the 1890 Darby Bible. And it reads, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And if I prophesy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I shall dole out all my goods and food, and if I deliver up my body that I may be burned, but not and have not love, I profit nothing. Love has long patience, is kind. Love is not emollious of others. Love is not insolent and rash, is not puffed up, does not have and does not behave in an unseemly manner, does not seek what is its own, is not quickly provoked, does not impute evil, does not rejoice at iniquity, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all, believes all, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether prophecy, they shall be done away, or tongues, they shall cease, or knowledge, it shall be done away with. Matthew 22, 36 and 40 picks up and says, with the Pharisees asking, teacher, which is the great command in the law? And he said to them, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy understanding. This is the great, this is the great and first command. And the second is like this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Of these two commandments, the whole law and the prophets hang. I want to focus today on Matthew, the 30, 22nd chapter, the 39th verse. And it says, and the second is like it. Thou shalt love the Lord, thy neighbor as thyself. And my subject today's message is loving myself first loving myself first and we have to understand that loving ourself begins a, a journey with God that will carry us through the ups and downs if we could all turn to our song of preparation is your all on the altar page 396 you have long for 
sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnest be fervently prayed but you can This morning, and, and I'm, I'm I'm hoping that you will be honest as possible, because I have to ask you this question, and the question is this: of all the people you know, of all the people you see, and all the people you hear about, you see on TV, you see in life. My question is this, who is the hardest person you will ever have to love? You see, in Corinthians chapter 13, which is also known as the love chapter of the Bible, Paul is writing about those things that clearly demonstrate what love is all about. 
and what love is not about. You see, within the past few years, America has become a country torn apart even further by racial strife through economic segregation, political and civil unrest. We have had hate speech and counter hate speech. And throughout our, the, this land of ours, we hear this constant talk about how, me, how we must love one another if America is to find its way back. But I must ask this question, if I were from another planet, and I ask you to explain what love is, how many of us could explain and describe what true love is all about. You see, when we look at 1 Corinthians, this was the message that Apostle Paul was trying to relay to the church of Corinth. You see, as I was studying this, I came across an article in Table Talk magazine, which is the Christian magazine. And in the article written by Dr. Stephen Lawson, that was titled Love Significance. He writes, tragically, this was the very point at which the church in Corinth fell short. You see, by all outward appearance, the Corinthian Christians had everything going for them. Strong teaching, lofty knowledge, profound gift, giftness, dynamic worship. Nevertheless, there was one area in which the early church was glaringly deficient, and they were deficient in love. You see, they had everything except love, and thus, in reality, they had nothing. You see, this underlying problem in the Corinthian church was due primarily to their pride. You see, they became and were self-centered, self-focused and self-absorbed. As such, they gave undue prominence to certain spiritual gifts, while at the same time, they, they devalued the more important virtue of love. You see, in particular, the Corinthians elevated public speaking gifts of preaching and teaching. They promoted prophecy and speaking in tongue, and they praised knowledge and learning. You see, they treasured the flashier, showier gifts that pandered to their emotions and catered to their flesh. You see, there's nothing inherently wrong with these spiritual gifts. After all, these are gracious gifts given by God himself. But you see, in the Corinthian church, these gifts no longer served as a means of grace to a higher end. Instead, they have served as a means to a higher end. You see, instead, they became what they were shooting for. A flashier scripture text, a flashier voice. You see, they were addressing their self-consuming arrogance. You see, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 a profound passage of the scripture that empathetically underscores the priority of love. This is what Paul was trying to get them to understand. You see, Paul's view of love is so basic, so fundamental to the Christian faith that one had to, had to understand that it meant absolutely nothing if you did not have love. You see, we had to understand and what Paul was pointing out in 1 Corinthians 13 and the first verse, he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I, I have love, I become a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. Verse one points out that I can be an eloquent speaker. I can have a vocabulary that would make men and women stand up and take notice. If from the pulpits, my words sound as if they were written by Shakespeare, 
spoken by James Earl Jones and filled with honey, Paul writes that if love is not in the foundational core of my words, then I am nothing but a wind chime blowing in the wind. See, the Apostle Paul is imploring the church of Corinthian and the universal church of today to understand that we can preach the greatest sermons, we can teach the profoundest lessons, and have the wisest counsel, and give the strongest witness. But without love, our words are empty and hollow. They, all, they are all sound and no substance. All rhetoric and no reality, nothing but hot air being blown around like the wind. You see, Paul goes on to say in verse two, and if I have prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but if I have don't have love, I have nothing. You see, verse 2 draws on the fact that I can have the academic achievement, the credentials of a Rhodes Scholar with every academic credential behind my name, PhD, MDiv, Masters, or whatever you want to throw back there. But with all that, without love, I am still nothing. You see, Paul asserts that knowledge is without love love because if I have prophetic powers and understanding all the mysteries and all the knowledge but once again if I don't have love I'm nothing and then Paul in his writing utilizes an exaggerated language in order to grab the attention of the Corinthians arrogant minds you see Paul argues suppose I have the spiritual gift of prophecy Suppose I have every mystery and know every mystery of God's eternal purpose. Suppose the future was in my hands of knowledge. Even suppose I knew everything that there was to know from beginning to end. Even with all this knowledge, I am still absolutely worthless if I don't have love. In other words, Paul explains that if these conditions were to hold true, he would still be a zero. He would be a highly gifted and a much applauded goose egg. He goes on to write in, in verse 3, And if I shall dole out all my goods and food, and if I deliver up my body that I may be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You see, Paul is saying that when I step back and examine all the good that I think I have done, how I have given food and aid to the poor, how I have sacrificed day after day of my time, of my money, of myself, verse 3 reminds us that after doing all those things, if I am without love, I gain nothing. He says, consider the Pharisees. They appeared in the houses of worship. They stood on the corner. They blew the trumpets and gave their alms to the poor. Then he asked the question, but what did it profit them? See, Jesus said that they had already received their reward, the honor of men. And that honor was paid in full. Because when they walked through life, they had man bowing down to them. They had man praising them. Paul says that theirs was a buy, a buy high and sell low religion. And their spiritual net worth was zero. You see, in Matthew 22, 36, and 40, Jesus finds himself being questioned by the Pharisees in an effort to try and discredit him. See, just as many today, it was common among ancient Jewish legal experts to try and dice up and decipher and determine which of the commandments which were greater and which were lesser. 
Which ones were light and they could find wiggle room with God versus which walls were more weightier and required more effort? See, in this case, the goal of the Pharisees was not to gain insight from Jesus, but they were trying to induce him to say something that they could discredit him with. But you see, what the Pharisees didn't understand is the question that they asked was full of mistakes to begin with because they started off by saying, Master, which when you talked about the Pharisees, they hated what other people called him Master. So they figured they would stroke his ego by saying, Master, which of the great commands, commandment, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You see, their question itself showed just how much the Pharisees and the Sadducees had strayed away from their teaching in an effort to trap Jesus. You see, with all their teaching and training, they showed their lack of love for the Son of Man, who was written much about in the Old Testament scriptures. So they should have understood and knew who they dealt with, but they were so clinging to what they had physically. Clinging to the adoration of man. And here comes this upstart, born of a virgin, or in their case, born out of wedlock. Born in a manger, couldn't afford a hotel. But then they also turned around and said, what good could come for Nazareth? So they were already discounting Jesus. But you see, when we look at the scripture, Matthew writes that Jesus answered them, and Jesus said unto them, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment. But you see, however, Jesus already knew the answer before they even asked the question. You see, because if you notice, Jesus goes back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament which describes his coming. And he pulls a treasure from Deuteronomy 6 and 5. And Deuteronomy 6 and 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, with all thy might. You see, and the thing was, was this. Jesus answered the second question before the Pharisees could even get around to thinking about it. Because Jesus goes on to quote Leviticus 19 and 18, and it says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he puts an exclamation point and says, I am the Lord. You see, you may be the Pharisees. You may be the Sadducees. You may have all the book smarts and all the knowledge, but see, I wrote the book you're quoting from. You see, I wrote those words. You see, I wrote those words that you were trying to adjust and wiggle around and minutia and, 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 and manipulate to fit your needs. But Jesus says, I am the author. Because, you see, he says, I am the author and finisher of your faith. So I know what is going on. I've been there. I've done that. I've got the t-shirt to prove it. So while you're spending time trying to figure things out, I've already known about what you're trying to figure out. Then we also go back to Matthew 22, 39. And he says, and the second is like unto the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. But what, what, what did Jesus mean when he says the two commandments are alike? It's obvious they both deal with love. But you see, the first commandment calls for a wholehearted love toward God. You see, this is the love that sh should consume every human fiber within your body, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. 
The second commandment calls for a charitable love toward our neighbors, our friends, and the strangers we meet. You see, it is a humbling, a sacrificial, a serving love. You see, Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang on these two. So the entire law is summed up in the principle of love. You see, in Romans 13, 10, Paul tells the people of Rome, love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, both the first and second commandment makes that point very clear. However, when I looked at the second commandment, I kind of discovered that within the second commandment, there are actually two commandments. And please bear with me here. The first part of the second commandment tells us that thou shall love thy neighbor. But then the second part of the commandment says, tells us that we should love our neighbor as what? Ours as thyself. You see, when we look at those last few words, the question must be asked, how can I love my neighbor when I have such a difficult time loving myself? You see, in 2021, it's hard to, sh to love yourself when we are constantly being told that your life does not quite measure up. Everywhere we turn, on, be it television, be it radio, be it the internet, be it social media, be our friends, be, be our loved ones. We are constantly being reminded that there is something either not quite right with our body, there's something not quite right with our mind, with our clothes that we wear, the type of job that I have, or the color of my skin. Something's not quite right. You see, John LaRosa is the president of Marketing Data LLC and is the author of 100, 100 industry market studies. Do you know that the total U.S. weight loss market industry grew from $69 billion to $72 billion in 2018 because I needed a, I got a little tummy here. I got a little chin hanging down. Something's not quite right with how much I weigh. You see, we also, it was calculated that the automotive industry in the United States spend $13 billion on advertisement. $13 billion. For 2019, eMarketer, which is the marketing research firm, says that the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry spent $3.6 billion trying to tell us I need a new pill. As Huey Lewis in the news said, I need a new drug. In 2018, Nike spent $3.6 billion. Then there is the king of advertising. The NFL drew $1.2 billion in ad revenue just on the playoffs alone. And over a single season, they would have earned $13 billion for advertisement. You see, when it comes to love, the United States has a funny way of showing it. Feeling down, feeling blue, take a pill. Not getting any play from the ladies, show them how, that you've arrived when you drive up in this. Not getting any love from the men, let's not leave anything to the imagination anymore. When you look at America and the nations, we have become a society of human builder bears. Suck this out, tuck this in, tighten this up, and then put back in what you sucked out in some other place to build that place up. You see, the founder of Huffington Post, 
Arianna Huffington wrote in 2014, first came the baby boomers, then came Generation X. Then somewhere between Generation X and the millennials, we had Generation Z. She goes on to say, I want to add another one to this. Generation stress. According to a study commissioned by the American Psychological Association, millennials are the most stressed out demographics. And it is reasonable to assume that their higher level of stress puts the millennials at a higher risk of all sorts of things, be it diabetes, obesity, and depression. This was never God's plan for his people. You see, which is why when we look at our scripture text today, Jesus says, to love thy neighbor as thyself. God laid out the game plan on how to love ourselves first in order that we may love our neighbors and him. If you recall, at the beginning of my message, I asked you a question. Who is the hardest person you will ever have to love? Well, right now I'm going to answer that question. Now, you ready? Now, you're talking to yourself now, okay? So, say your name. Say your name, Emmanuel Marshall. I want to introduce you, I want to, introduce you to the hardest person you will ever have to love. Say your name. The hardest person in 2021 to love is ourselves. You see, in Corinthians, it says, if I speak with tongues of men and angels but not have love, the question is, how do you talk to yourself? Do you take what other people say and let that become who you are? Do you encourage yourself to love yourself? See, are you waiting for someone else to do that for you? Are you in an abusive or a toxic relationship and only stay because you think this is love? Has your vision of your future been stolen? You see, when we look at God's word, the question is, what have we given away? You see, because when we look at Proverbs in, verse, in chapter 29 and verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. A servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understands, he will not answer. Seeth thou a man that ha is hasty in his words? And it says, there is more hope of a fool than him. You see, God is not speaking to the masses. He's speaking to us as individuals to not let man steal what God has given us. You see, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But see, we have given way to Nike telling us we have the wrong thing on our foot. FUBU telling us that we're wearing the wrong clothes. We're not take, if you want to do better, take this drug. If you're depressed, take that drug. You want to lose weight, do drink this. If you want to do this, do that. If you want to be more exciting, climb Mount Everest. But if you tell them that God loves them and that God has never told us to stop seeking and searching for the vision that he has placed with each and every one of us, Every person here, every person that's listening, God has given you something very special. Some he's made teachers. Some preachers. 
I'm gonna twist this a little bit and say, some he's made ushers, some he's made choir members, some he's made deacons, some he's made charge of food preparation. So God has given you a gift. But too many times we listen to man who tells us that our gift is not good enough to satisfy them. My gift was not and is not to satisfy you. My gift is to glorify and praise and worship God. That is my gift. When we seek out the vision that, has God, that God has given us and stop worrying about, do I look good in a Corvette? Do I st and stop worrying about if I live in the right neighborhood. Because see, when the story ends, you got two neighborhoods to choose from. You're either going to go upstairs to heaven or hell. Those are your two neighborhoods. You see, Satan's sole purpose is to use anything and everything to kill and destroy who we are. But you see, while Satan is trying to kill and destroy who you are from the inside, God continually is reminding us daily that in the end, his word will prevail. You see, if we are to find love within ourselves as individuals, we have to understand one thing. Love has long patience. Love is kind. Love is not jealous of others. Love is not insolent or rash. Love is not puffed up does not behave in an unseemly manner. Love does not seek what is its own. It's not quick to provoke. It does not impute evil. You see, throughout verse 4 in our scripture text, Paul shows us what love is like. How patient are you, are you with yourself? Not your wife, not your kids, not total strangers, but how patient are you all with yourself? Have you learned how to forgive yourself of past mistakes? We don't forgive ourselves. See, the first thing we have to learn is, is that, number one, we are not perfect. Never will be. But the question is, is that when you make a mistake, can you forgive yourself? In 2021, we have to realize that everybody is looking at us. Everybody is staring us down. And the sad part about it is, is that we have given up God in order to placate those who are staring us down. We are quick to give up on God. But see, what I've learned in my 58 years, I'm going to do dumb stuff. It's plain and simple. I'm going to do something dumb. I'm going to sin. From the time I woke up this morning till I got to this moment, I've probably sinned. And more like I have sinned. But see, the thing about what I know about me is this, is that I'm forgiven. And no critic, no internet troll, no internet person who can get on, the, on a soapbox and say anything about me can do anything about it. You see, because I, see, I love myself because I understand that God loved me. You see, God loved me so much 
that he took the time to send his own begotten son to die on a cross just to make sure that when my time gets hard, I can look to the cross and understand he died for me. He gave up his life for me. So there's something about God's love that tells me that I am his own. So why is it so difficult for me to love me? Why is it so difficult for me to understand that I am loved? Despite what my friends may say, despite what my boss may say, despite what critics may say, despite what anybody else says, I only care about what God says. Because, see, in the end, the critics will pass away. In the end, those who have a problem with me being as big as I am, I get over it. Because I have the love of God within me. And when I love myself, that means I can love my neighbor. Because I love myself, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because I love myself, I have no problem telling people about the goodness of God. Because I love myself, I know that I can continue to love God day by day. Because, see, the love that God has shown me tells me that the love he gives bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And this love endures all things. You see, Paul continually shows in this, chap in this chapter of Corinthians that the way God intended for us to love ourselves is to continually strive to love him. It's not going to be easy. We're going to face temptation. We're going to face trials. But you see, the good thing about this is, this is that I can go back to the Old Testament and see what King David said when he said, I was young. And now I'm old. Yet, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. See, we've got to the point that we got, we've got past the need. And we're demanding what we want. You see, we may only have a ham hock in the freezer. We may only have a bag of beans. But see, that's today. But see, tomorrow, God's going to supply some more. You see, this morning I kind of learned when Isaiah went to the widow who said, I only have a little bit of oil. I only have a little bit of bread. And then we're going to die. If you look at the story, after she made a little bit of bread. There was not this huge deluge of bread. But there was enough in there day by day by day by day by day by day by day that kept her alive, that kept her child alive, that kept them coming back day by day by day. We've gotten upset when I can't go into my closet and choose from 15 suits. Wow, hey, old. We get upset when we go into our cupboard. All we got is Cheerios. We complain when we get up and go to our job. We complain when our check from the government didn't get here fast enough. Wow. 
And God is saying, have you looked in the mirror lately? Do you understand that the love I have for you goes past what anything man can do for you? You see, what I like about Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, is in the eighth verse. And in the eighth verse, it says, love never fails. Love never fails. You see, Paul sums it up that love never fails, but Dr. J. Meredith, a touching life ministry, puts it this way. Let me tell you how I know God love is real and never fails. He said, it's because God is love. You see, God doesn't have love. God doesn't do love. God is love. There's a big difference. See, we look at love as something to have, to own. We want to buy love. We want to sell love. We want to trade love. If we are love, then we should be able to give away freely. If we are love, we should be able to accept it freely. I shouldn't have to tell someone, well, if you love me, you will. So as we come to a close, if you want to love your neighbor better, if you want to love your husband or wife better, if you want to love your children stronger, if you want to have a closer walk with God, then start loving yourself the way God intended for us to love ourselves. You see, love is not Love is active and visual. You see, God demonstrated his own love for us. You see, God's love was visible and demonstrated when he gave his only begotten son. And his son gave up his life through his personal sacrifice to encourage one another, to love one another. Love is intentional and specific. The love of God made a way when there was no way for sinners to find Jesus, to have eternal life. You see, Christ died for us. Love is sacrificial and unmerited. Its visible and intentional deeds of love are costly and it was undeserved. Love is timely and thoughtful. And at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Encouraging deeds of love that are timely because those who take the time to love also takes the time to love thoughtfully. God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that we, we may have access to life. But the question is, is that how much do you love yourself to accept the love of God? Is God, is man more important, the love of man more important than God? As we come to our feet, we want to open the doors of the church. If you do not have a church home, you are able to reach out to our office by calling 381-3858. And someone will be there to assist you by picking the right option. But remember, God loves us. 
And the more God loves us, the more we should love him. We should go out and tell somebody about him. But Jesus took me in and just moved the light from heaven filled my soul. It filled my heart and love take back and you won't get a bill because the bill has already been paid. And if I we want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who paid the bill for my sins, for our sins. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you showed us what true love is. That we understand and know, Heavenly Father, that it's through you we can find hope in a land where hope is slowly fading. We can find joy in a land that joy is slowly fading, Heavenly Father. Father, bless and guide America, Heavenly Father, that we may return and find our way back to you. That we can return to your presence. We have to remember that America was found because of you. Heavenly Father, we love you. We adore you. We magnify your name. This is how we pray. Amen. Amen.